How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thanks. Good. Um, Neil has written two books, .NET and XML, and Mono, a developer's notebook. And they're both O'Reilly books. Um, Neil, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you got into computers? computers? Well, um, I've, I, this is a, long, well, a, t a typical long story, I guess. Okay. You know, uh, um, I got my first computer when I was uh, 12 years old or so. It was a Sinclair uh, ZX80, I guess they were called. Uh, ever since then, I've loved them. Uh, graduated from college, and my first job was uh, was in computers. And uh, moved up through various languages, ended up being a Java programmer and ultimately a .NET programmer. Okay. And that's how I came into the .NET world. Wow. And so how did you go into the... Uh XML and Mono world, and how did you enter that project? Well, I, I was I was doing Java programming, and uh, the company I worked for was bought by another company that was a Microsoft-centric okay. company, let's say, uh, and got moved on to a different project where I got to pick the platform, but it had to be a Microsoft platform. Yeah. So being a Java developer, the logical platform was .NET, which at the time was still fairly new. And um, so we picked .NET because it was similar enough to Java that we could figured we could get up to speed on it fairly quickly, and uh, and just started uh, writing some code. Well, the uh, book uh, Mono Developers Notebook. How long did it take you to write that, that book? That was a really interesting experience. Uh, it actually only took eight to ten weeks when I think about it. Um, we. Uh, we knew that Mono 1.0 was going to be released around July of, uh, I forget the year it was now, but uh, about uh, three to four months before that release date was coming, my co-author, Ed Dumbill, uh, asked me if I wanted to help him write this book. Okay. And we planned it. We, uh, we, we wrote uh, basically a chapter each every week. Wow. And in eight to ten Amazing weeks, we had it all written. And then, of course, production time to get it printed. It yeah. was ready on the day the uh, Mono 1.0 was released. That's, that's great. Um, what parts of the book were you mostly responsible for? Uh, because of my .NET background, I really wrote uh, the parts that talk about the C-sharp language, okay. the, uh, the common language runtime, the uh, framework, framework class libraries, and the basic stuff. And of course, the XML pieces, because I had the XML knowledge from my previous book. Uh, so that, that was the majority of what I did. Okay. And you also worked on the Mono development project. Uh, I, I would, did not really contribute to the project itself, except in the book. Okay. Uh, ex you know, some uh, submitting bug reports and things like that that sure. I found while writing. Okay. So yeah. Um, the uh, can you just sort of maybe for those that aren't familiar with really what Mono is, mm -hmm. sort of describe a little bit about the Mono platform sure. and the sort of uh, problems it's trying to solve. Yeah. Well, Mono is an open source implementation of the .NET um, common language runtime okay. and the framework class libraries and the C-sharp language. Okay. So basically, Microsoft, when they developed these things, they submitted the standards to the ECMA standards body. So there are two ECMA standards that define the .NET runtime and the C-sharp language. Um, Miguel de Acasa, who founded the Mono project, uh, wanted to have he was looking for a, a quicker way to write applications for Linux. Uh, and he saw that there was this language out there that looked like it was a good candidate for it, and it was an open specification. So he put together this project. He founded it and uh, started the community and is still running the, the project wow. for Novell now. Um, and uh, so the idea is that Microsoft developed this whole platform uh, as a potentially cross-platform, uh, uh, cross-operating system uh, uh, platform, but they didn't implement it anywhere else. So the Mono project takes that open standard and implements it in other places. Okay. So because of that, you can take a .NET uh, program that was compiled on Windows and then run it on Mac, on Linux, on m many different Unixes, uh, not just on x86, mm -hmm. on Intel platforms, but on the mainframe, on uh, the little uh, I forget the model number, the little Nokia uh, N, uh, N770, I think they're called, on the ARM chip, okay. um, on, on uh, Spark, on a whole bunch of different platforms that Microsoft never okay. had implemented on. Oh, amazing. That, that's interesting. Um, a few que a question about the .NET and XML book. Uh, so how did you write that book? Did that... Um, 
you mentioned that you did not use Visual Studio at all, so it's sort of shocking that you could write a book on .NET and yeah. not include Visual Studio. How did you, what was your approach to that book and what, what makes that book unique? Well, the idea was that um, I was doing, you sort of have to go back and look at the way uh, a couple of Java developers were doing .NET code. We didn't want to use Visual Studio because we didn't know it. We had our own tools that we had used in our Java development. Um, and so we were doing our .NET development without Visual Studio. And I guess it's, it's one of those things that maybe people don't really realize that you can do that. There's a command line compiler for, dot, for C Sharp language. Um, all the tools are there in, on the Windows command line. So my idea was that I wanted to actually write the code instead of having wizards write code for me. Um, I'm just a little bit old-fashioned in that way, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, so I actually decided that I was going to write the book uh, from the perspective of someone who didn't know anything about Visual Studio. All they wanted to know was how to write the code and how to compile it and how to run it without having to click on buttons and, and uh, have, have, a, have a, an IDE fill in the details for them. So, and, and there really was no book on the market that really got underneath the wizards uh, yeah. to see what was really happening. So I decided to write it. Well, that's excellent. Um, you, you've also done some work with uh, automating the data center. Can you talk just a little bit about sure. that? Sure. Yeah. Um, what I've been doing is I've been working um, with, uh, with companies that are moving to a virtualized environment. One of the gotchas behind virtualization is that uh, it really doesn't, people think that it, it simplifies your environment, it makes things easier to run because you don't have to install new hardware to put up a new server. But the trick is that it actually means you've got more management problems because you've got, instead of, uh, instead of uh, having to go and rack up a new server, it's as easy as pushing a couple of buttons to build a new server. So you get server sprawl that you never had the same problem with. I mean, there's server sprawl in the physical world, yeah. but it's more manageable because there's physical boxes and you run out of space, you're out of space. With virtual machines, you don't run out of physical space. You run out of disk space, you run out of memory. But you're, until you run into those uh, limits, you can just keep adding more and more virtual machines without feeling any pain until you start realizing, I've got all these VMs out there and I have no idea what they're doing. I don't know who built them. I don't know if they're patched. I don't know if they're, you know, if they've been run in the past six months. So the idea is to automate um, management of your virtual machines. That means uh, knowing where they are on a disk, if they're running, if they've been run in the past, you know, six months or a year. Uh, if they're up to date with patch levels, if they're a Windows VM, that's obviously really critical, uh, even with Linux. Um, and then things like uh, automating um, the operation of them. So one of the great features of virtual machine of virtualization in general is that you can migrate a VM from one physical server to another. Um, but once you start doing that, you lose track of where they're running. Yeah. So you have to go and look physically at each machine, go to a console and list out what VMs are running on it. So the idea is to automate that kind of stuff so that you have a single console that can show you all these different machines, uh, show the current status, show where they're living right now, yeah. automatically migrate everything off a certain physical host so you can shut it down for maintenance, stuff like that. Huh. So you're, uh, the, the work you with data center is really played into your next interest, which was virtualization. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a planned book on virtualization? or I'm, I'm sort of tossing around some ideas around that. I don't have anything solid right now, but I'm talking to some editors, and we'll see. And what framework do you use for virtualization? What? Well, I'm using the Zen hypervisor okay. primarily, but you know, one of the things that's interesting about virtualization is that more and more the hypervisor itself is becoming a commodity. I mean, we've seen, um, you know, Zen is free, KVM is free, uh, VirtualBox I think is free, you know. Uh, VMware is feeling the heat from all these free hypervisors. And I think we're going to see more and more the technology itself under, underpinning the virtualization is going to be free or cheap. Okay. And then the management of those VMs is where we're going to have proprietary tools coming out, as well as open source tools um, to really uh, to manage uh, different hypervisors, different virtualization technologies uh, from a single console. Very cool. 
and, and uh, just make things simpler to manage. Well, uh, Neil, thank you very much for your time. Sure. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you.